Hello and good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, wherever you are. Um, welcome to the openness and privacy webinar of OSPA. Um, I still, there's still, I see there's still people coming in, um, but we have over 400 people registered, and that means probably I think we'll end up with about 200 participants today. Um, registrants come from all continents and from about 53 countries. Uh, we usually see a large group from the US and UK, and today is no different. Um, but still, we still have a, a pretty good global spread. Um, our attendees come from over 300 different organizations. Uh, just over health are from academic institutions, mainly academic libraries, all types and sizes of publisher, and a number of NGOs, services, associations, funders, and nonprofits or charities. So, welcome to all of you who have joined us today. Um, let us know where you are uh, in the chat. Uh, my name is Vincent van Gerven Uy, uh, and I'm one of the board members of the Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association. Uh, and I will be moderating the webinar today. Uh, thanks also to Chloe and the uh, Copyright Clearance Center who are hosting this as they do for all OSPA webinars. And this enables OSPA to cover a lot of topics and offer them for free and ensure wide participation. Past webinars can be found on the OSPA webinar uh, uh, website and the address you can see uh, on the slide. We will also record this webinar and uh, you will be able to find the recording uh, on that same, uh, under that same link, uh, hopefully later uh, this month. Um, OSPA organizes free webinars on a regular basis addressing different aspects of open access publishing and today's seminar will address the issue of openness and privacy. And we have four invited speakers who will address this rather broad topic from a variety of angles from the perspective of licensing, libraries, scholarship, and internet governance. And considering the breadth of the problems and the issues that concern questions of openness and privacy and their interaction, um, and also sometimes their friction, as we will see, uh, we can only hope to skim the surface today. But I'm counting, as always, uh, on a lively discussion. So each speaker will present for around six minutes, after which we will open the floor for a discussion, for questions, for comments. Um, feel free to leave your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, you will find uh, a, a button to the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and we will try to address as many of those uh, uh, questions as we can in the time allotted. Um, uh, but for any unanswered questions, we will also ask the panelists to uh, uh, provide brief written answers that we will then also post together with everything else on the website. Uh, so if we don't get to your question, don't panic. Um, now, let's uh, start with our uh, first speaker today, uh, who is Molly van Howling, um, who uh, is from the University of California in Berkeley. And by the way, all the biographies uh, you can find on the website, so I will not introduce everybody at length, but uh, you, you can read about that on the website. So Molly, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you so much for including me in this important conversation. I hope you can see my slide, which is illustrating Berkeley, California, the University of California, Berkeley School of Law, which is my home institution, and that's where I'm joining you from today. My academic field of study there is copyright law, and my obsession within that field is openness in part because of where I got my start before joining UC Berkeley's law school. I was the first employee at Creative Commons, where I currently serve as chair of the board of directors. As you may know, Creative Commons is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. And so that means that I, as one of the first employees, have uh, over 20 years of history with the organization and thinking about the intersection of openness and copyright. And so I thought I'd get us started today with some of that history. It's my own personal history, um, but it's also some of the history of Creative Commons as an organization that created the most widely used licenses for open access publishing. It's also the history of copyright that sets the stage for Creative Commons creation. My own expertise focuses on US copyright law, and so that is what I will be describing, but it has parallels elsewhere, which I hope folks will raise when the discussion continues in Q&A. 
So I started at Creative Commons back in 2001 uh, at the founding when in my mind, the problem that we were setting out to solve was this, that the internet clearly at that point had the potential to unleash collaborative creativity and knowledge sharing. But copyright was serving as an unnecessary obstacle because the default was that creations were all rights reserved, regardless of the intentions of the creator. Now, this situation of automatic copyright protection, even for things that were created out of an impetus of sharing, it wasn't always the case in the United States. This is a quote from a report back in 1976, where members of the US Congress observed that since 1802, our copyright laws have always provided that the published copies of works must bear a specified notice, a copyright notice, you're familiar with that, as a condition of protection. This was a prerequisite for protection, placing in the public domain a substantial body of published material that no one is interested in copywriting. In other words, the default in the history of US copyright law was for works to enter the public domain, not to enter the protection of copyright upon publication. But that ironically changed with the series of changes that were instigated by the legislation that accompanied that very report, a series of changes that started in 1976, continued through 1989, and resulted in the situation where those prerequisites for copyright protection, like putting a notice on your work, those and all other types of formal requirements were eliminated, and copyright became automatic as soon as something is fixed in a tangible medium of expression, basically as soon as it's written down. Now, there are some good reasons for this. It protected authors who might otherwise inadvertently lose their copyrights because they didn't have lawyers or know about all of these nitty gritty details. But by the end of the 20th century, the budding potential of the internet suggested what our predecessors, as indicated by that language from Congress, already knew that all rights reserved automatically for everything was unnecessary and harmful, given the range of motivations for creating works of knowledge and creativity. And so it seemed those 20 years ago that copyright was broken and was particularly ill-suited to the internet age. And so there were a number of ways that this might be addressed. You could imagine uh, going to Congress who had changed the law in one direction, maybe they could change it back. But the trends at the time all seemed to be in the opposite direction. So just in 1998, Congress had passed the Copyright Term Extension Act, which extended the duration of copyright in the United States to a, to many minds, excessive life of the author plus 70 years, which has now become really the global standard. So what about the courts? Copyright law in the United States is authorized by constitutional language that says that Congress can promote progress in science and the useful arts by granting to authors and inventors exclusive rights to their writings and discoveries for limited times. Is this really even still limited when copyright lasts so long? And does it necessarily promote progress in science and the useful arts when it locks up things that their creators might just as soon have out there in the open? Well, in fact, some of the very founders eventually of Creative Commons, Larry Lessing and Eric Eldred, brought a challenge that went all the way to the Supreme Court, challenging the constitutionality of some of these changes. But they also ultimately lost that judicial battle in 2003. And so at the same time, they and other founders of Creative Commons started thinking about whether there was a way to improve copyright without changing copyright law by making it easier for people to opt out of this automatic regime. And that was the essence of the original Creative Commons idea, to give people a key to liberating their own works, which copyright otherwise locked up automatically. So at the founding of Creative Commons, we saw copyright as a key obstacle to sharing and licenses as powerful tools to overcome that obstacle. And most people understandably associate Creative Commons with those licenses, and they are something that I and the rest of the Creative Commons team are certainly proud of. But to me, the essence of the CC founding idea is not licenses or even copyright. 
It's the desire to overcome the most pressing obstacles to sharing of works of knowledge and creativity. And so as Creative Commons looks to its next 20 years, I think it's important to think about what those most important obstacles are today. So what does better sharing mean today and what are the obstacles that need to be overcome? Well, one set of obstacles I think is familiar to everyone in this audience. And that is just the practical realities, the economics, business practices and incentives of the publishing industry that can sometimes put pressure on scholars to publish in outlets that insist on copyright transfers and closed models of publishing. Those can be obstacles regardless of the existence of Creative Commons licenses. Another potential obstacle we are coming to recognize is the topic of today's session, and that is privacy, and namely concerns about privacy as an obstacle to sharing. People not wanting to make their works of knowledge and creativ creativity as open as possible because of concerns that they will be misused. One recent example of this was controversy over use of both CC licensed and otherwise licensed photos to train facial recognition systems using artificial intelligence. And because these types of obstacles can loom as large as copyright once did as barriers to sharing of works of knowledge and creativity, I'm really eager to hear from the rest of today's panelists about related issues at the intersection of sharing and privacy, including things like concerns with data subject privacy and open access publishing. So I'm delighted to be part of this panel and look forward, forward to learning a lot about that intersection. Great, thanks so much, uh, Molly. Um, our next speaker is uh, Chris Bulock from the University Library at California State University, Northridge. Northridge, excuse me, without B. Thank you. Um, so yes, I'm a librarian at California State University Northridge. Uh, primarily, we have a lot of undergraduates. We have uh, nearly 30,000 undergraduates. And so a lot of my, my focus is kind of based on people who are just kind of using library resources and using open access resources alongside with those. So a short time ago on Twitter, I asked the question, is OA good for privacy? And I was lucky enough to get answers from uh, a couple experts on the subject. Uh, Lisa Hinchliffe said it could be, but won't be. And to get a little bit more of an idea of you know, what that answer means, I've linked to a presentation, I'll put this in the chat later. And then from Dorothy Salo, uh, paywall tech becomes obsolete with open access, but then you know, open access journals can still do web tracking. And again, I have an article that I'll link from her as well that really takes a deep dive into some of the, the challenges of both the paywall tech and then also um, you know, kind of issues around privacy with all kinds of library resources and other you know, research people are doing. So I wanted to talk a little bit, though, about when a library in our own tools and systems, when we present open access resources alongside our subscription materials, um, kind of the ways that we can introduce tracking without even really thinking about it. So this is a record from our own system, but uh, you know, we, we get this system provided by Ex Libris, which is you know, a ProQuest company, but becoming a Clarivate company. Um, Clarivate notably is essentially a data broker at this point. And if you look at the, the, uh, the privacy policies for both Clarivate and Ex Libris, it makes it clear that they share data with affiliates, whatever they gather. And we do know that uh, you know, even from past products, Ex Libris does track what people are doing in the system, what article records they view, and a kind of chain of that information. Uh, so that's already just our system provider is able to track users here in our system, and they're able to see what they're reading um, and where they're going. So in addition to that, if we look just at the beginning of this record, we can see they know they've identified that it's an open access article. Uh, there are some things that don't introduce a lot of tracking, like this PDF link at the top is actually using unpaywall data. And nobody even passes through unpaywall. They just go directly to the full text. But some of our other approaches do have people passing through a variety of other services. Um, 
you know, we see a DOHJ link, of course, we have PubMed and PubMed Central. But then if we look at the bottom of the record, we also have links where we're potentially passing people to Google Scholar. Uh, this comes up the most when we don't have a full text link or maybe there's one that's not working. And so if we're exposing people to Google Scholar, to Google, certainly we're exposing them to lots of different web trackers, ad networks, uh, super cookies, things that can kind of track somebody's identity and what they're reading. Um, and then we also, uh, Ex Libris has sort of a, an agreement with Elsevier, and you see we have a link out to Scopus here as well. Um, we don't even subscribe to Scopus, but Scopus uh, generously allows us to see the citations. Of course, then we're also kind of building Elsevier's knowledge of what our own researchers are using if they're clicking through these. Um, and so that's another way in which we're introducing people to tracking. But there's other situations that kind of make this even worse. Um, you know, Dorothy Salas' answer of with open access, the paywall side at least becomes obsolete. So nobody has to log into a proxy server, uh, the whole problem of seamless access where potentially institutional identifying information is being presented to publishers um, technically becomes obsolete. The problem though, is that our library systems are really built for a closed access paywalled world. Um, and it's particularly tricky when we look at hybrid journals. So this article is correctly identified as being open access, but it is in a subscription closed access journal. Um, so this is a hybrid OA situation, most likely the authors paid an APC to make it available. The problem though, is that our system favors the link resolver, which can only know at the journal level, whether something is available or not. So we're still putting people through the proxy server, um, which means that we also have a server where we have a record of what somebody has accessed. Now, libraries can have hopefully uh, good practices about you know, getting rid of that data, not tracking stuff in insecure servers. Um, but the way the proxy server work, it does log, you know, the files that people are downloading through the proxy server. And we're introducing that kind of needlessly here because it's an OA article. Um, so we're not even actually losing the paywall side of it, even with open access material in many cases, um, thus kind of adding needless tracking to it. Um, I should also add that with the previous one, you know, the, the full text here lived with, um, you know, a, a Springer link journal too. So often, you know, when we talk about open access, we're not always talking about like a scholar led, uh, you know, really ideological focused open access effort, but we might be talking about large data brokers and other companies um, that are, again, able, if you look at their privacy policies, able to harvest quite a bit of information. And so that's all for my presentation. I look forward to some questions later. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, our next speaker is René Marieu from the university, the Free University of Brussels, or should we say it in Dutch, Vrije Universiteit Brussel. Um, so uh, I'm René, René Marieu. I am a researcher at the uh, Law, Science, Technology and Society Research Group in Brussels, and my work is on data protection. And uh, I would like to speak uh, a little bit about the interconnection between uh, the use of personal data in research uh, and uh, how we have this uh, increased institutional pressure to open uh, and share the research data that we would, with, that we use in in research, uh, and the conflict that that sometimes has uh, with privacy considerations, in particular when we do research based on personal data. Um, so, uh, my own research, for example, uh, and this is also I got par partially interested in this, uh, is uh, based on, for example, doing interviews with people, and when I do an interview when I record an interview that 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 um, that data that I am using for my research is clearly uh, personal and not only is it personal data it's also very difficult if not impossible to anonymize um, either because the voice itself is in it is in essence personal or also because what the person says can be 
clearly linked to uh, to a person. Um, so uh, there are reasons not to make that fully publicly available. Uh, the same is for many other types uh, uh, um, uh, of data. Um, on the other hand, we want to have data used for uh, research open, uh, for example, for, because we want to be able to validate uh, research results um, or because we want to use the same data uh, for uh, other studies so that other researchers might not have to uh, collect new data, but could theoretically use data that has already been collected uh, by, uh, by researchers before. Um, now, um, in Europe, um, where I'm working, and I don't know if this is the same uh, uh, in other places, but at least in Europe, there is more and more focus on having data uh, openly available. Uh, research data openly available. This is um, in, implemented in such a way that now often in order to get research funding, uh, you have to present a plan showing how you're planning to make uh, your research data publicly available. Uh, this is happening at the EU level, but also at the level of uh, member states. And it's, it's a requirement in almost all major uh, funding schemes at the moment. Uh, so because of that, what you see is that since uh, uh, the, the, the funding makes it obligatory to look at this, universities start to build policy. Um, so for example, uh, uh, universities um, uh, make uh, policy obliging uh, researchers to, to make sure that they uh, open up their research data. And so they... Um, propose to, to help research with that uh, by building technical infrastructure, uh, potentially working together uh, across universities, um, and sometimes uh, by helping by offering data stewards uh, who can be uh, librarians or other uh, specialists who, who know more about either the technology or the logic behind the sharing of data. Uh, so that uh, researchers uh, who do not necessarily have the specialized knowledge can uh, can contact those people to uh, to get uh, support in, in in setting up good systems. Um, in the end, often uh, though, it's the researcher who has the final responsibility, or at least in the systems that I've seen around, like. There's happening a lot of uh, on the policy level, but in the end, the researchers themselves have to uh, uh, make sure uh, that they that they um, make uh, data publicly available, and that is actually um, quite uh, complex, especially when you have to deal uh, as a, a researcher with the conflict between having to open up data, but that data also being personal data, and so that being a reason for not having to open it. Uh, uh, up. Um, and this can lead to quite a lot of frustration for researchers because they have these two conflicting values, uh, which they're both pressured to take serious without any clear resolution for making those uh, values uh, come together. Um, so the main problem then is uh, when we have uh, this uh, uh, this personal data, that it, as an example, uh, let's say uh, interviews, uh, recordings of interviews, uh, we have the, the question of uh, who is allowed to access um, this data. Uh, the answer can be uh, no one or someone, but maybe only when they have signed a non-disclosure agreement or only affiliated researchers or only researchers, but only after the original uh, interviewee has been uh, given their consent for this. Um, we have the question of how to, even if we know how we want to des decide who is allowed to access, then we have the question of how to manage that in practice. Um, and as already mentioned, like the, the, there's often this idea that, well, uh, anon anonymize the data to make sharing possible, but with many, many categories of data, that's, that's not possible or extremely difficult and expensive. Um, and then additional problems, but those problems are probably also existing with other um, uh, kind of data, is how to uh, uh, store this data actually in a secure way and how to uh, uh, secure it in the long term. Um, 
So what we see now is, is that um, these, uh, for the solution to this, although there is this high level policy making, the solution is expected to come from individual, individual researchers who often do not have the specialized know-how to deal with this question. Um, and uh, who are often also, uh, uh, to, to, while the common norm now is to, to just have data uh, locally. So as a researcher, you do your research and you keep the data yourself. That makes, uh, that, that, that is very unstable. If, I'm, uh, if I would go as a researcher to a new institution, then it's very questionable what, what will happen to the data and if it still can be, uh, can be shared with others. Um, but on the other hand, the institutional solutions, uh, so the policy making uh, at this moment is still at such a high level and, not in, and often not even taking into account the question of this conflict that we have with privacy and personal data, uh, that no serious solutions uh, are um, coming from uh, that side. Uh, moreover, if uh, in as far as institutions are aware that this problem is and providing um, uh, some solutions, they often do not take into account how extremely complex this problem is and also the extra, uh, the extra uh, cost in terms of time and or money that they put actually on the researchers who have to deal with this problem. Um, so what could be uh, uh, a way forward? Well, first there is the question, to what extent do we really have a problem with openness when it comes to um, the use of personal data in research? Um, because my own experience is that actually in the current moment when I want to do research that is related to already existing research, I would have found that research already uh, through the normal process of, of finding a paper that has interesting research based on interesting data. And if I would want to have access to that uh, data, what I would normally do is I would directly on a one-to-one -one basis contact the researchers behind uh, that research. And by establishing that contact, um, I could make um, very detailed or specific um, 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 Sorry, I'm missing the word. Uh, I could make uh, a specific deal or a spe specific arrangement on how to uh, make best use of that data and uh, make the conditions uh, clear under which sharing would be possible. Um, so the real issue that we have to tackle is that at a very general level, we have to still do a lot of research on how um, the pro how um, personal data can be shared and what are general best practices for doing so. Um, and if we would have uh, solved this um, question at a more general level, then data stewards or librarians could uh, act as an in intermediary uh, channel to help uh, researchers on the ground to implement uh, those uh, best practices. Um, uh, and then, in order to, um, uh, to make sure that, that we um, uh, deal with the underlying problems that seem for me to be the cause of why we are focusing more and more on open access uh, of research data um, is probably not to make the underlying data more open, but maybe more uh, value replication studies, which are now just maybe not done just because they're not scientifically valued and also to value studies uh, with rejected hypothesis, because also the fact that now a research, um, which does not lead to fleshy and positive, so-called positive results, is not uh, deemed often deemed interested uh, in the research community. And maybe that is the reason that there's an incentive to, uh, 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 to uh, commit uh, fraud with uh, research data. So uh, this um, concludes my presentation and I hope uh, that um, this will contribute to the other interesting um, uh, conflicts between uh, privacy and openness that we've seen so far. And uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you uh, very much, Renee. Um, our final speaker today is uh, Farzana Badi from uh, Digital Medusa. Hello, everybody. I am going to 
So my name is Farzan Abadi, and I am uh, I have been involved with internet governance at the infrastructure level as well as uh, platform governance uh, for the, for over a decade in academia, but also uh, in uh, various uh, policy uh, making uh, venues such as um, Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Today, I'm going to talk to you about security and pri uh, privacy at the internet infrastructure. And I'm going to talk about who is. I'm going to use probably a lot of jargon. So um, uh, <laughs> stop me and <laughs> let me know if it's not uh, clear. Um, so what is this who is? When you register a domain name, uh, like you know, facebook.com or evil.com or um, digitalmedusa.org, uh, you um, need to give some information about yourself. Now, if you're like a natural person or, or a legal person, you have to give the name, you have to give your uh, email address, postal uh, address and a phone number and uh, you give this to the person uh, to the organization you're buying the uh, domain name from well you're really leasing but that's another issue but um you give this information and uh today if you go to who is um and uh like a who is a source and see uh, who has like registered a, a certain domain name uh, you will see the record like as it is on, on the screen. And you can see the email, uh, phone number, uh, postal address uh, has been redacted. So this wasn't like that for many, many years. Um, so historically, who, who is actually predates the prevalence of the internet? It is a 30 year old pr uh, internet protocol. Well. They, um, the technical people are reluctant to call it an internet protocol, but that's uh, fortunately we don't have to title that here. So why does it exist? Um, uh, many, many years ago, uh, the internet was not so widespread globally and uh, engineers and users wanted to have access to other domain name registrants to, their, to contact them in case something was set on fire on the network and tell them, hey, we are getting attacked. So this was a very close knit community. They almost knew each other. All of them almost knew each other. So they used this who is to uh, access the information of uh, domain name registrants. Um, the registrars and registries, which are entities that are involved with the registration of the domain name, or didn't even exist at the time. Now, everything changed after like 1995 uh, and uh, we had this um, uh, kind of a, a global interconnectivity and millions of people um, got online and uh, you know, the close knit uh, community was not um, there anymore, but everything changed, but who is, didn't change. And there was, so imagine that you can now go to, uh, like uh, 20 years ago, you could go to um, uh, who is uh, uh, search and uh, look up like people's uh, addresses and phone numbers and stuff like that. Um, but this, this wasn't changed because who is was used for other purposes. Uh, so security researchers, uh, used it. Some built the business model based on it, collecting personal data and non-personal data. And uh, this was to um, uh, as to contribute to security of the, of the network and, you know, combat phishing and malware. Uh, there was, of course, intellectual property rights, like there were so many cyber squatter and, uh, and uh, and to the trademark holders, they um, they found who is as a very effective way of uh, sending that threatening letter uh, to the domain name registry. And of course, academics and um, the, the social and legal and uh, technical and academics used who is to look at like demography to see how many domain names have been uh, registered in what regions and so, uh, so on and so forth. But Imagine 
that you could now globally have access to people's email, postal address, phone number. And you could access it anywhere in the world, from anywhere in the world, and whoever wanted it. Uh, so this might lead to doxing human rights abuse and silencing uh, political dissent. It is, it is an issue, despite the fact that they, they keep telling me that, uh, that I need to bring them data. I mean, bringing people uh, in prison, like, I mean, it, it is very difficult to find that kind of data, but okay. So this is not, this is exaggerated and it's not, a, it doesn't resu uh, result in human rights abuse. They might just come and steal your dog because of the content of your website. You don't, uh, you know, they don't like the, content of your website. So the policies that are related to this, uh, who is and how it is uh, implemented are uh, made in an uh, organization called Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. I'm not going to tell you how it <laughs> makes policy for now because it is very complicated, but because of the, and this is uh, my take on it, and there are a number of papers written on it, that because of the dominance of intellectual property rights owners and alignment with the, uh, the security stakeholder group that they all wanted this data to be available and public and not pay, uh, pay for it to have access to it or uh, not, uh, you know, not to go through processes that, uh, to have access to it. They kept for a long time who is was kept uh, public. Now, at some point, approximately between 2009 and 2013, I'm really sorry I was, I'm not uh, uh, specific on this, but uh, so they introduced privacy proxy services because the, the problem with who is being public was identified in 1999. We knew that there was a problem in the, the engineers themselves said so. And they came up with other protocols, but nobody wanted to adopt them because it was they were just inconvenient. Uh, so at some point, uh, they came up with privacy proxy services that redact the personal information of domain uh, domain name register and a fee, and um, that was one solution. Um, sometimes people didn't know, especially in developing countries and Middle East, uh, uh, in the Middle East, uh, in one case, didn't know that these services even exist. Uh, but this was uh, some kind of a measure that they, they took. And then um, there were also all these studies about how this privacy proxy, privacy and proxy services affected the security of uh, who is. Now, we um so for a battle of uh, 20 years of uh, civil society and privacy uh, rights advocates wanted to uh, make uh, who is uh, private at ICANN and they couldn't they couldn't do it i mean they did make some progress but then in uh, 2018 gdpr uh, which is like a european data protection law came into effect and you can imagine that there was this a big fight about um, like who is data being redacted. And uh, there were various stakeholders that were very upset about it. And they said that we are gonna be insecure. There is gonna be like a lot of trademark infringement and, um, and uh, all sorts of like also academics uh, also, um, uh, also criticized it. So, so we had re uh, security researchers, intellectual property, law enforcement got involved, law enforcement used uh, who is, um, uh, uh, you know, to combat crime. And by law enforcement, I mean global, globally law enforcement could use it. And uh, then also there were the registries and registrars that uh, were involved. These are the guys that actually uh, don't uh, register uh, your domain and service it. And uh, so there was, there were, um, there's this word that people don't like to use, uh, but there were people that wanted who is to be public, like name, phone number, and uh, mailing address and stuff like that, or at least uh, some part of the, um, uh, some part of it be uh, public or be more easily accessible, and there were uh, there were this uh, this crowd that wanted to 
I wanted the data to be redacted, but also were in favor of disclosure of data for legitimate persons. So what was the uh, what was the effect on academic research? Uh, there is this uh, study that was done on security papers found that 69% of survey papers um, needed to use redacted quiz information. Now um, there are some uh, criticism about the uh, the paper, but this is this is, I just wanted to show you the mentality and how important. Uh, access to who is um, and personal information of domain name registrants is for uh, certain groups. Okay, so um, and uh, so uh, there were all these talks at ICANN as well about how to give disclosure, how to legitimate, because GDPR does provide uh, certain uh, means to, in order to have access to uh, personal data, especially for research or even security researchers. But um, but the uh, but the people that had access to public who is and had built their business model on, on it or had used it um, uh, before, and because like sometimes these security issues have to be tackled really quickly. So these people were not happy uh, and they were, uh, they were against, um, uh, they, they were against uh, private uh, who is and, and redacted personal information. Um, so, um, at some point, the lawmakers, uh, you know, these are uh, the same uh, institution that came up with um, the GDPR, they came up with this network and information security directive. And there are some, um, there are some, some, uh, pe some say that this directive kind of undo, uh, undo, uh, undo the whole thing that the GDPR has done for who is because it specifically mentions who is and data and privacy are there and then uh, also um, uh, and there are like all these like um, most of them are more than more about how the registries and registrars are going to be affected. Uh, but um, objectively, if you look at it, uh, there's only Article 23 that is uh, kind of problematic, uh, which says that publish all registrations related to legal entities. And this is because um, uh, this is because uh, there was this fight. Um, this so so uh, th this is because they actually. Um, so, so they, uh, the stakeholders uh, here at uh, like the security researchers and law enforcement were not happy that all the data was redacted. So um, we have this uh, article 23 that uh, kind of uh, is uh, problematic, but it's a directive. Don't think the, um, so now I'm not saying that who is data is not important. I believe that there should be legitimate uh, ways of having access to the domain name registrants uh, data. I, a lot of the good research that has been done used uh, who is, but it should be um, in a, a legitimate way and as GDPR is speculated. Thank you. Thank you much. Uh, so thank you very much for that. I thank you again to all the other speakers. Um, I think, I mean, one of my immediate takeaways is that when we um when when we work in, in in my case in open access publishing we always think that the road to openness is this kind of highway and we're going to this horizon of openness and i, I think we, we very often do not realize that not only are there obstacles on that road towards openness but also that it very often we have trajectories that actually go towards closeness and that those trajectories are really not very far uh, uh, in the past even or even I mean, recently happening uh, as in the case of uh, Farzana's presentation. Uh, I think that it is a very good thing to keep in mind. We already have a few uh, questions in uh, the Q&A box, but I would like to give maybe first the presenters um, the uh, possibility to respond to each other if they have questions for each other. And, uh, and then we move on to the questions from the audience. So. 
if you have any questions to each other, and then now is the time. Yes, Molly, go ahead. Thanks, Vincent. I do have a question for Renee. Renee, I think I understood you to suggest that it would be desirable, or at least not a bad thing, to have the default be not open access to research data, given the privacy concerns that you raised, but instead a default that the data is with the researcher and can be made available upon individual requests from other researchers who have a good reason to use it and might agree to uh, the privacy terms and so forth. And I'm curious why, if you think so, that is preferable to a regime where the default expectation is that data will be made openly available and the exceptional case will be that where the data is withheld because of the kind of legitimate privacy concerns that you've raised i'm curious whether you think that the the majority of data sets implicate the kind of privacy concerns you've identified and so therefore the default should be closed with openness upon request um, and if not i guess i i would be interested in considering the case for the uh, default being open with exclusions from that being made under individual circumstances. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a very, uh, uh, like a question that comes precisely to the point. Um, and I understand, uh, I understand your concern. And I think uh, you've also summarized my position correctly that indeed, I think uh, that in many cases when the research uh, is based on personal data, then uh, the default should be uh, uh, that uh, that is closed by default. Um, like I, I want to say, what one aside is that, like in principle, I am extremely in favor of like of open access in almost any of its forms, uh, both for data and for publication, especially also for academic publications. Um, but the default rule, um, at least in, in Europe under GDPR, is that personal data is not supposed to be publicly available, except under very stringent conditions. Um, and I think a key problem is that even if we were to say, well, data should be public for research purposes, once it's public, uh, then it is public, and it's not then it's a, then you're unable to limit it to to research purposes. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so I, I think that that having it uh, by default open is not the solution. Uh, but I also really feel with you that 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 the other default is also really feels somehow wrong, and that is why I also think that. Because having spoken also with other specialists, both both um, uh, data protection officers of uh, academic institutions and librarians and people who really have thought about this question, it seems that we have not find found yet a, a good, I don't know if it's possible even, a kind of intermediate position or a type of way in which openness can be extended without uh, going too far in terms of data protection. I think that that um, one of our uh, attendees uh, have, have put something precisely to that point in, in the chat, and I read it here from Christina Drummond. Um, I often hear this debate in terms of open versus closed, but the reality is that there are many shades of gray. This is why data collaboratives, data trusts, and data intermediaries are emerging to steward specific data use. Right. So this would uh, you would, for example, deposit as a scholar your data in this data trust, and the data trust collectively manages these data according to some 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 guidelines so they're not completely closed off in the sense that they're at the researcher's computer but they're also not completely open in the sense that they're just freely available with the doi and anyone can click on it um so there seems to be these infrastructures uh, emerging that, that that address precisely this this maybe false dichotomy um all right, well, at any moment, feel free to raise your hand if you want to comment and so on, and, and, I, will, and I will see it and we'll manage. Um, the first question, uh, which is addressed to the entire panel is from Katrina McCollum. Um, whether the panelists think that there is a potential benefit to science knowledge creation in making personal data about how researchers find access and discover knowledge available for independent research, right? So the type of data that, that, that Chris was talking about um, if so, how can we create legal instruments, licenses, or other types 
uh, or community norms to, to ensure that this meta research data is not proprietary, right? So Chris showed the ways in which all this data is gathered, but may it not be profitable if we again all would share um, uh, these types of research data amongst each other? And how can we kind of take back ownership of those data? Well, um, if, if I might comment on that then, um, you know, the, the question kind of includes part of what makes it so difficult. Um, and especially, you know, when libraries and other systems for doing research rely so heavily on uh, for-profit companies and private companies, they're going to be gathering data separately um, and have no real incentive uh, to share it. Um, so part of it is just the way the data is gathered. Part of it is also, uh, especially in countries like the United States, where we have relatively weak privacy protections, um, it makes it difficult to, to kind of change that system. And another side of it is that even if we were able to dramatically change that system and have, uh, have data that's gathered in a transparent way and sort of available to researchers, um, it's also difficult for any data set to really make it fully anonymized in a way that can't be later tied back to individuals. Um, if you have like a long chain of the specific research someone is doing, I mean, there's even you know open data in terms of if that person is an author, what they're citing. And if there's a really heavy matchup between, you know, their research pattern and then what they're citing, you could easily tie it to an individual and then tie it to further things that were maybe of a more personal nature they were doing um, and kind of infringe on their privacy. So I think there are a lot of difficulties with something like that. Then we have a question. This is a clarification question for Farzana uh, from Dick Festijk. Um, How can GDPR enhance copyright infringements or did I misunderstand? Oh, <laughs> that's a very good question. So uh, they use the, um, this is what the intellectual property rights holders actually claim. Uh, they used um, the uh, domain name information, the personal information that was in who is before in order to find if they saw that there is like infringing content on the website and um, they would go and find the information and then send letters uh, to take down that kind of content. Um, and now uh, they have difficulties to do that because now they have to go through a process to get access and they have to also have a legitimate purpose. And uh, most of the time the uh, copyright infringement like the registrar is not convinced that this is a case of copyright infringement. So what they argue that it's more like a trademark, what they argue that is these infringements are much more because we can't uh, have access to these people, uh, contact information to send them that threatening letter at, or like, you know, to solve the problem. What, what I hear from, from Frizana's answer and also from what Chris said is that there's, there's this very interesting, um, there's this interesting question about who wants what to be open for which reason, right? Because very often when we talk about openness, we think from our own perspectives as scholars or as librarians or as data workers in which openness by definition, uh, uh, maybe not in the case of the privacy uh, uh, examples that Renee brought up, but openness by definition means we, you know, we, we further the good of mankind in one way or the other. Whereas from a law enforcement perspective, the openness does something very different, right? And so how do we, how do you think, uh, this is maybe again a question to the panelists or maybe even to like the people in the audience if they want to respond to this, how these intentions for openness seem to be often very contradictory. Um, what are ways to think about those intentionalities? Uh, so uh, I think that um, these things, they have, we have discussed these issues for a long time. Like the directive on data protection was in 1995, if I'm not um, mistaken. And GDPR, I mean, I'm not defending GDPR. I don't think any law is perfect. But they come up with like a legitimate purpose. And how do you, how do you actually establish that legitimate purpose? And... Uh, I think that uh, by kind of understanding the legitimate purpose and uh, restricting 
the possibility of abuse, uh, then we can um, uh, we can be able to like uh, cater to uh, those who want to have access to the, uh, to uh, data, but in a more uh, systematic uh, way, uh, and we can also like. Um, block other people who might want it for nefarious pur uh, purposes, because, of course, law enforcement everywhere is not like European law enforcement, <laughs> you know, law enforcement sometimes does human uh, rights abuses. But then, of course, if we have those structures in place, which is very difficult to do, then we might be able to um, give access and uh, in an easier way and to a broader uh, spectrum of uh, purposes. Right. I, I, I wouldn't say that in the European Union or in Europe, no human rights abuses by law enforcement happen. I would say that there's a rather idealization. Um, let's let's uh, move to again uh, our Q&A because I see some new questions coming in. Um, this is from, from uh, Julien Chicot. Uh, could the move towards fair principles, so the FAIR principles, solve tensions between openness and privacy? I'm not sure if some of you are familiar with the fair principles, maybe maybe Chris or Molly, um, would you want to answer to this? Well, I, so the short answer is, is I think no. Um, I think they don't really help because they, as far as I have understood, or for, at least as far as I've experienced, that's maybe better saying it as, a, as an experience, is that those principles don't incorporate the inherent tension that is there. And that is exactly the, the main point that I think I tried to raise. There is really an inherent tension of, of multiple values that are both important to take seriously. And, 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 and that is often, I mean, in, in law, that's normal. Like we have like a charter of fundamental rights and, and that's like, I know we have tens of different fundamental rights and we, we often uh, encounter uh, conflicts between multiple fundamental rights. Uh, but those are not resolved by just making high level documents about naming all those, uh, uh, name, naming those uh, uh, conflict, uh, several values. And I think often solutions are found in practices. So people who have somehow just dealt with that, those type of things out of experience, they have to, I think, sit together and really look at concrete examples, how did we do it? Why did we do things? And then from the bottom up, see if some general like mid-level principles or something can, can be deduced. But that, that is a lot of work that I think mostly still has to be done. I will offer that that answer resonates with me from a limited perspective in my capacity as a faculty member at a research university and seeing my own home institution struggle with trying to articulate a, uh, I think a pro sharing pro openness policy that in its early drafts, um, at least struggled to take account of all of the concerns that researchers might have in particular with the privacy interests of their subjects. And so um, I agree with Renee that these could be good projects uh, for finding out where the real uh, difficulties lie. And my limited experience suggests that they remain quite difficult uh, despite the articulation of guiding principles. Um, great, yeah. Um, let's see, let's move to some more questions here. Um, I have another, uh, well, we kind of answered, Jennifer, your question about um, best practices and models. I think this is precisely what we're trying to figure out uh, um, uh, here. Um, and maybe also the lack of public documentation of these, these best practices, right? So we have something like the fair principles. So we have principles, but we don't really know how these are implemented in practice. And maybe indeed, as, as Renee said, we, and I'm only indicated we need much more practical examples for you work in sociology, you have this data set, you, you work at this type of university, what did you do, right? Um, but I have your question of Katrina, um, it's for Molly. Um, it's a rather lengthy question. Many of the very large publishers are opposed to the move by some funders to require that their grantees make their accepted manuscript immediately available under a CCBY license if their article is being published behind a paywall. Uh, namely, for example, the rights retention strategy uh, as proposed by Coalition S. 
Um, the fear of publishers is that everyone will stop subscribing to the version of record and it will undermine the value added services that publishers claim to provide. Um, two questions uh, against that background. One, could pu publishers legally prevent authors from sharing their accepted manuscript? And two, do publishers have the right to stop researchers from sharing a Word document after it's been peer reviewed? So my short answer is it depends. Uh, whether a publisher has the right to object to publication of the submitted manuscript or the peer reviewed uh, version um, depends in part on the nature of the publication contract, which may or may not assign the author's copyright to the publisher, and it may or may not give the publisher exclusive rights regardless of who owns the copyright. It also may or may not be preceded by agreements with other entities. For example, at the University of California, faculty members grant a non-exclusive license to the university, which predates their transfers to other entities. So the intersection of those things will determine whether there's a conceivable right uh, for the publisher. But in some cases, there might be as either a matter of copyright law, if they're the copyright owner, uh, or contract law, if they've extracted a promise from the author, they might be able to object to further publication of either the accepted manuscript or the peer-reviewed manuscript. The peer-reviewed manuscript introduces additional complications because in addition to its use of the author's copyrightable work, it may have elements that represent copyrighted work contributed by other people, by editors and so forth. Now, this won't always be the case. I think the editorial process won't always involve copyrightable contributions by anyone other than the original author, but in some cases it might, and that could be the basis for a copyright claim on the part of the publisher. Now, all of this, uh, what could the publisher do? And it depends, uh, of course, in the background of that, to me, is the question about whether it's desirable for authors to enter into contracts, copyright transfers, and other relationships that make them unable to republish their own work to ensure that it's archived forever in either its submitted or peer reviewed version. And as an author myself, and I also serve on the board of directors of another nonprofit called Authors Alliance, which tries to be a voice for an enabler of authors who want their work to be widely available forever for to preserve their own intellectual legacy. Thinking of things from that perspective, I certainly as an author would like the right to ensure that both my original and peer reviewed work is available for readers forever. And um, one way to do that is to retain rights and to openly license my work so that even if I lose track of it, other people will have the ability to share it going forward. And so that's why I think it's important for, uh, for organizations, including funding organizations, to look for ways to enable and empower and facilitate rights retention by authors. And it's more than just rights retention, because having your copyright doesn't guarantee that you won't have contractually bound yourself to not do things that you might want to do uh, with your work. So it's a whole constellation of legal things, uh, as well as the motivation and incentives and sometimes the necessary resources uh, to help people make choices that allow them to keep their work available for readers. If I could just uh, echo that and also say that I would always urge authors to really carefully read those agreements with their publishers. Um, I know that most editorial systems have it as just like a click through thing now. And it's like the last step before publication in many cases, and you just want to get it done, but please read the whole thing. And most many publishers will also be willing to negotiate if you have terms like that, that you prefer to insert. Uh, so it's always worth going through that because you don't want to sign away your copyright or your ability to post, you know, the peer reviewed copy. Hey, thank you. Um, there was one question and I suddenly sort of disappear because I think that Chris answered it, but I'm not sure if everybody saw that. So I'm just going to repeat it here and I, hopefully maybe you don't mind answering it again, Chris, in public, um, which I think is an interesting correlate to like the data that is gathered, let's say, internally through these uh, uh, library catalog systems is, of course, the data that more and more publishers are currently providing publicly about their authors and what you know what is in their books and where they are affiliated and how all these things are connected, right? For example, through an ORCID. 
which is uh, supposed to be, at least in theory, a universal identifier for an author. And the question is uh, from Christina Drummond again, uh, do you have any privacy concerns related to the global use of ORCIDs uh, as unique author scholar identifiers, especially in this age of data brokerage and reuse? And again, so like, it seems like such a nice thing to be able to identify uh, one author and, and all, in all their publications and, and have created these giant networks of, of relationships. But at the same time, these data are public and they can be sold and reused for all kinds of other purposes. Um, and so my answer is that I'm generally not especially concerned with it, in part because, you know, the academic incentive system is so weighted towards, you know, getting credit for your publications. Um, and there's also such a huge benefit to being able to disambiguate between people who have the same or very similar names um, that I don't, this isn't an avenue where I think we need a big fight. I do think that anytime where you have compulsory identifiers where, you know, institutions are assigning grad students an ORCID um, and publishers absolutely require it, it's somewhat concerning, but at the same time, I don't think that uh, have, if you already have your, your name and institutional affiliation tied to something that the ORCID is essentially uh, just a convenience after that. Right. You see a great, you see a greater risk in the way that these library catalog, but for example, do, do um, students actually ever consent to giving their, their data to these systems? When we go, for example, when I browse the catalog at my university library, to which I still have access as an alumnus, I never, I don't think I ever consented to my, my usage data being used or resold by Ex Libris. Um, I mean, yeah, they, they have a, a publicly posted privacy policy, but uh, of course, even when you log in, I don't believe there's, you know, a checkbox and many institutions in the US um, are not especially good about having accurate privacy policies, I would say. Um, in, I don't think there's anything at, at CSUN, for example, that fully and accurately gives the picture of how many third parties will have access uh, in the course of somebody's study for students, for example, to you know, their data and everything that they're doing, as well as um, as we move potentially towards something like seamless access where you know, identifiers uh, from like from Shibboleth and potentially other you know, data frameworks are being exposed to publishers. I don't think it's clear yet what exactly could or will be shared under those net frameworks either. Renee? Um, yeah, just just uh, following up on that, I, I, I think I agree with Chris, of course, that the, like the main purpose, uh, uh, purpose of ORCID uh, seems to be benevolent, or like, let's, let's just say is benevolent, it's useful. Um, but the, the problem with this kind of schemes, and I don't want to say anything particular about ORCID per se, because I do not know what is the exact model behind that in terms of uh, financing business model, but is that often it is unclear that what happens with those collect, uh, data collection or uh, and, and, and unifying schemes, if that's only that beneficial thing or are other things also done with that? Uh, and, and that re often remains very unclear. And I think that problem is extremely, uh, becomes extremely much worse if uh, somehow institutional factors, uh, basically as Vincent also indicated, force you to take part in those kind of schemes. Um, so, so I would, would like to add that caveat. Great, thanks. Um... Tim, I see that your question is more or less related to this as well, um, but I'm not sure if we can get to that at the moment. I want to round off because we have two minutes left and maybe I would like to round off by uh, asking for Zana, you have sketched out some of the legal avenues that some of the current legal battles that are taking place in the field of privacy versus openness. Where do you see this going into the future? Very briefly. <laughs> where the powerful wants to go. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's unfor unfortunately, uh, uh, despite the very strong uh, privacy uh, culture in Europe, and I think I have some connectivity issues, so I'm not gonna talk much, but um, uh, we, I think that the security crowd is going to, uh, 
the security crowd is definitely cutting you off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, that was a rather a fit end to our uh, to our webinar on uh, on openness and privacy. I want to thank all the presenters, Rene Mio, uh, Molly van Houwing, and Chris Bulok for Zanabadi, and of course uh, Chloe from the Copyright Clearance Center for facilitating all of this. Um, the recording will be posted on our website together with a record of the uh, questions and answers. And um, we definitely hope to see you again uh, in one of our next webinars. Thank you for attending and have a wonderful morning, afternoon and or evening and night. Thank you. <laughs>